it continue? It continue. Yes. There we go. So, as I said, you can start whenever you want, whether you want to start just a face or start with sharing screen. Right. Well, let's see, how many do we have now? We have 76. Um, I don't want to cut people out if they're a little bit late in the start. So let's let it run a little more until we, until it seems to stop adding. I assume that they're accustomed to having to wait at the beginning of something like this because of the But of course, this is also being recorded, so That's anybody fine. who comes in late can go back to the recording. Uh huh. Yes. Okay. All right. So why don't we go? Out? Well, wait a minute. We're at ninety-five now. Why don't ninety-six? The department gets one dollar more for each edition. <laughs> we wish. Okay, maybe we should start there. Okay, so we hit share screen, and now, yes. you want my first slide? Yes. Uh, how are we gonna get? And share. Share. Yep. And then you hit the. Well, wait a minute, how are we going to get the um, the other bit on here where we have the photographs of us? Oh, well, it's over oh, here. It's, right? already, it's already it's there. Already. Okay. Okay. All right. It looks like we're ready to go. All right. So I'm assuming that everybody can hear. Um, I have no idea to what degree. Uh, my voice carries and to what degree you can hear it well. I suppose what you should do is raise your hand and complain mightily if you can't hear. Um, so this is biology 140 and 440. And um, I'm going to begin with a small set of about four slides with printing on them uh, that uh, deal with the, the overall of the course itself. And then we'll start on the actual lecture for today uh, after that. So let's go on to the first one. And um, this is a, a very complicated salami that can be sliced in many different ways. This course is not a simple A, B, C, D, E, uh, linear progression um, towards any particular uh, knowledge base. It's more a, a matter of um, understanding a, a very large and complex thing that can be sliced many ways depending on what a person's personal interests are. So I start by asking you to ask yourself why you're here in this course because I don't believe this course is a required course for anybody. So the question becomes, for you to think hard for yourself, why you're in this course, why it is that you want to be hearing these things, these lecture topics, and 
put yourself to grabbing from them what it is that works for your agenda, for your schedule, for your mindset, uh, rather than my trying to dictate a um, bureaucratic structure that you are to learn and absorb. Now, I can also ask why am I here? You know, why am I standing up here in front of you talking to you if this was a in-person course or as a Zoom course now? Um, and I'm here because I grew up emotionally stimulated by the graduate students and faculty at the University of Minnesota in the 1950s. So they seemed to me to be a normal way to go about living. And so that's what I simply did. I went to graduate school, I became a professor, and I still am one at the age of 81, standing up here and talking to you all. Um, however, since it started in the 50s, which is you know more than a half a century ago, um, what I am going to convey to you is a, is a very peculiar mix of the past of things that you yourselves will never be able to see or hear, you certainly won't be able to experience them directly, but you may hear about them from other people. And the night in the 2020s where we are now, in other words, the future that we're both diving into and also all this long history that I've lived with to make me what I am. So it's a peculiar complex and I'm, in any given lecture, I'm torn between which way to go. Do I try to anticipate forward or do I try to bring to you what was going on in 1950 and 1960 and 1970 and the reflections of the people who were still alive and talking at that time. So uh, that will be a complexity that will be inside the course. Now, finally, the question is, what am I here? I'm a professional storyteller. That's what I do for a living. The stories I tell are called lectures in a university, okay? Now, in fact, from my viewpoint, what they are is we all live in a little village, in a little valley with mountain ranges all around us. And our grandparents are there, our children are there, our neighbors are there. We have this unit, 50 people, 100 people, 200 people. And I decided one day to climb up over that mountain ridge and go and visit the village in the other valley. And I saw things, I learned things, I got shot at, I got welcomed, I got fed, I learned new things, I saw things I never imagined. And now I climbed up over the mountain ridge back down to our village and I'm standing in front of a campfire and you all are sitting around on the ground and I'm just telling you what I saw and my interpretations of what I saw. Now the little kids, basically blank hard drives, are absorbing this without really understanding what I'm even saying, but it's adding to their programs that are going into their hard drives. The middle-aged people, yourselves, are looking at this and saying, hmm, what can I take out of that to use for my own agenda, for my own life going on down the road? It could be facts, it could be ideas, it could be philosophy, it could be danger, it could be happiness, all these different things. So each one of you is dissecting what I say, picking out the pieces that work for you and ignoring everybody else. So that's the middle aged. Then there's a bunch of old people in the village who are sitting there and listening to this and thinking, aha, how can I use that to raise the fitness of the whole village? Because by now, the surviving old people have got their own offspring spread all through the village. They can be grandchildren, nephews, nieces, and all the other relationships. And for them, their survival is really that the village survives. So now they're hearing what I say and putting in the context of, all right, what do we do next? vis-a-vis -vis the future that's gonna hit our village, okay? So what I'm doing is just telling stories. And I have to say, it's the same thing I've been doing since I was 10 years old.
Now, this is my first course taught by Zoom. I've given <laughs> lectures by Zoom to classes in South America, the classes here in Costa Rica where I'm sitting and looking at you. Um, and, uh, but as for me, an adventure. It's the first time. I'm still stumbling through this forest. My wife, Dr. Winnie Hallwax, is right across the table, and she um, can hear better than I can, and she understands this world, this computerized world that you live in, um, far better than I do. So I periodically get uh, Which isn't help. saying much, but I'm local tech support. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, um, in these logic, in these uh, adventures that we're going through, there is a um, detailed instruction for this course parked on Canvas. This is for both Bio 140 and Bio 440. So I count on you to go find those detailed instructions and read them for yourself. I'm not going to read them to you, okay? So you're going to find those and read them for yourself. The next thing to say is this Zoom lecture will all be recorded. Every future one will be recorded um, in between 3, 3 o'clock and 4.20 p.m. Um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then deposited on Canvas for viewing at any time. Okay. Now, there's two versions on Canvas. This course, which I have taught since uh, about 1978, um, or maybe a little earlier than that, um, oh, has been on the web for the students forever. And each slide that you're going to see, which of course are my notes, um, has a text piece to go with it, which used to be available on the, on the website URL that was available in the whole world. I've now taken that text piece and put it in a second slide next to the one that I'm going to show you now. If you want to go to Canvas and get out that other version of this lecture that has those text pieces attached to them, it's right there. So there's one like the one we're going to work through today without the text, and there's going to be one with a text, which you could kind of view as a kind of a textbook if you like. But really what it is is that after I'd given this course for about 10 or 15 years, I um, sat down and simply tried to write out what I had just said about a given slide. And so that piece is the text I'm referring to. Okay. Now also in this Canvas, on the Canvas uh, site uh, for this lecture, there will be zero or one or maximum two individual papers associated with it. They're papers that were very carefully written by their authors. And I expect you to take only just to read whatever there are there, one or two. It's not meant to be an onerous site, I mean, an onerous task, but it means for you to try to absorb that paper. And I'm not referring to all the numbers in it or things that are numbers in it, so much as why it was written, what does it say, what lessons does it send you away with, okay? So it's meant to be a carefully worded small text piece that goes with each lecture. And finally, well, almost finally, this particular lecture that we're in right now today is in fact one that used to be a single lecture. But because it's new for me and new for you, uh, I've taken to split it into two. So we're going to spend an hour and 20 minutes today doing the first half of that lecture. And on Friday, we're going to do the second half. So that's why it's called lecture one and two. But it really, in my mind, is still lecture number one. It's just that we're going to spend twice as long on it as we normally do uh, in the previous courses that we've done. Now, finally, uh, Piazza is available on your Canvas website. And for there, you can put questions, which um, uh, Ozan, our uh, course teaching assistant, uh, whose photograph is over there on the right-hand side uh, with the headphones on and the beard on his face, and uh, he and I will both attempt to answer your questions. But please think hard about the questions that you put on there. Uh, we will not grade you on the quality or the content of those questions. It's only a matter of 
looking at them and trying to answer them for you as briefly and concisely as we can. Okay? Now, there are four of these talking slides, so I'm going to go to the next one. Um, I am a professor of conservation biology, and the stories that I tell all relate in one way or another to keeping the wild species on the planet alive, okay, in the face of human destruction, basically. Um, and so what it boils down to is that I'm doing what I was doing since I was 10 years old, as I talk to you. I observe the way nature operates, and I try to figure out how to ameliorate humanity's impact on that. Because my own craziness is that I would like very much to see wild nature survive, to be part of the society that occupies the planet, rather than to be pushed off the side and turned into hamburger and soybeans. Okay, so. It's called humans and the environment, but I'm wanting to focus you more on the environment than on the human. You've all been studying humans since you were before you were born. So I don't have much new to tell you about humans. You've already experienced an awful lot of what humans are. But the wild world out there is something that your genome for six million years, if not a lot longer, has pushed away, has ignored, has harvested, has eaten, has killed in one form or another. And you've mostly spent your time avoiding it or eating it rather than actually treating it like another species that you would like to have around. And so you actually look at it and think about why it does what it does, okay? So the whole point of this course is not to learn a lot of facts. Those are just tools in my mind. What I want to do is think about the organisms that we're going to look at and what they do and how they relate to humans, to yourself and to other people, as well as to each other, because there are like 30 million of them, 30 million species of them on the planet. All right, we're dealing with a lot of different ways of doing things. Now, this first story, the ant and the acacia is a look at the environment. Remember, environment isn't just the weather. Environment isn't just whether it's hot or cold today. Environment is not just whether the river is muddy or clear. Environment is all the things that are out there, okay? Is a look at the environment that contains these other things through both their evolutionary history, how did they get to be what they are, and then what do they do as being what they are? And so we're starting really with how they do, how, excuse me, how they got to be what they are. And then it, uh, it, it, then it dives into what they actually do as an ant and an acacia. Acacia, for those of you who aren't familiar, is a kind of tree, okay? So we're dealing with an ant and a kind of a tree. So there's our title slide. And remember again, these slides are all available there for you to go back to and look at anytime you want. I should add here that the, the exams, the middle, the two midterm exams and the final will be open book. So you can go back and look at these slides at that time if you want to. It'll take you time and, the, and the, the lectures, I mean the exams have a particular amount of time available. But the point is, this is like having a textbook of your own there in your computers. I'm hoping that all of you are working off a laptop or a screen of that size rather than a small handheld of some kind uh, that will really shrink these. Now the, the active verb or process inside of these two plant things, the ant and the tree, the active, the active action in there is this process which we as evolutionary biologists call coevolution. I think you all know the basics of what is evolution. Coevolution is defined as I change me, I species X, Y, or Z. I change some piece of what I do. You, the other species, respond to that change by then evolving something else. I then respond to that 
by evolving something else. And we go back and forth. Okay. That's the co of the co-evolution. And I think in your own daily words, the failed process perhaps most familiar to you related to this is an arms race. I have one nuclear bomb, so you got to get one nuclear bomb. Well, if you got one, I got to have two. So then I'll get two. And then we go up the ladder and pretty soon I've got 150 and you got 200. And then I decide to invent a new kind of nuclear bomb. So it makes all your 150 ones obsolete. Well, then of course, what you're gonna do is figure out some way to get my recipe for my nuclear bomb and build two of them instead of one. Well, I think you all understand that process. It's been going on all around you. Um, that's a kind of coevolution. Okay. Now, we're not dealing with <laughs> nuclear bombs here, but that's just a process that humans do. So the beginning of this thing, we start with an acacia. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to say that Dan wasn't actually laughing about nuclear bombs since I'm really the only audience that he has. I was making a little joke, but I'll try not to distract. <laughs> okay. Now, an acacia is a many, many species of acacia, and they go in Australia, Africa, South America, Central America, up to Texas. Um, and uh, they're small shrubby trees, like the one you see standing behind this camel. This is an African acacia in this particular case. And one of the characteristics of these um, trees, these acacia trees, is that in addition to growing in dry areas, they have a lot of spines. The spines are there, selected for, evolved for, deterring browsing mammals from eating the leaves. Okay, that's one of their defenses, those spines. So if we were to up be close to this acacia behind the camel, we would find that the branches, you can see green leaves there, but the branches have lots and lots of spines, which have been part of the evolutionary history of this thing in a dry area where there are things like camels who love to eat their leaves. Okay. So the more the camel browses it, the more the thorns are produced, both phenotypically and also evolutionarily. If there were no camels and no goats or anybody in this, in this Moroccan desert in Northern Africa, um, that tree would have very few spines on it. But you turn a camel loose in there, the tree responds by making these. And over evolutionary time, it responds by evolving these so they're in the genome as well, okay? So that's the first characteristic in the ant and acacia thing that we need to understand as a kind of piece. The second is that if we look closely at the leaves of these acacias anywhere, Australia, South America, Africa, wherever, on the leaf, let me get this pointer out here just a second. On the leaf right here are these little protuberances which are called nectaries. And so they're called foliar nectaries. Foliar is the leaf. This whole thing in the photograph here is the leaf. And this is a foliar nectary. And the plant exudes sugar from that. And the sugar attracts ants and wasps that come along to eat it, but they also then defend it as their own, which helps the tree by having non-defoliators. So in other words, the insects that will be eating the leaves would be taken out by those ants or the parasitic wasps. <coughs> and um, uh, so that's the selection for these nectaries. The, all these acacias have them. <coughs> so that's a second characteristic that is an ingredient in the story. The third one is, no, excuse me. Yeah, the third one is that there are ants in the system who live in hollow twigs. This is a hollow twig off a tree branch that had been hollowed out by some insect and the ant colony is inside of it. So that's where they live. They live in trees, not in the ground. They live in hollow twigs in trees as part of their normal life. And these ants are predators. So they're right around catching insects, okay? So that's the third, a third element in the system. Now here's what the whole tree looks like, all right? So that's, that's a, 
that's an acacia from, uh, in this case, Costa Rica, oh, Mexico, sorry. And um, so it's just a big sort of spiny tree like that. But if you get up close to it, in those thorns, and this is an ant acacia now, this is not just any old acacia, but you see the big thorns right there, and then other thorns right there, and a north thorn right there. If you take all the leaves off this tree, it looks like that. In other words, it's got more than a lot of thorns. Every one of them is fat and thick and has a big volume. That's a third element. Here are the thorns close up as they're being produced. These are new thorns. Just, they're green, they have just been made by the plant, they're still alive. And here are the ants, as you can see on the surface. And um, this, this has a big volume inside, several cc's inside of this, and several cc's inside of that. If you open it up, it's full of soft pulp, which you see here. And the ants go in, they cut a hole in the entrance, in the, uh, cut a hole in the wall of the thorn and clean out all of this, which gives them a space inside the acacia. So now we have a house on the acacia that the ant colony can live in instead of a hollow twig. So here is one of those holes right there. And there's an ant with its head sticking out of the hole. Here are the nectaries. And now the nectaries on these leaves are producing enormous quantities of nectar, much more nectar than on an ordinary acacia. You can see these bubbles of liquid on the up top here. That's because it's making more faster than the ant colony can collect. So we're talking about lots of it. And in a greenhouse, it ends up looking like this. This is crystalline sugar dried down by the air that gives you, that dries out, and so you end up crystals of sugar heart there, all coming out of this nectary that you see right there. And uh, here's the thorn that we were just looking at. And so that you can see that the, the leaf, this thing here, is coming out of the base of the thorn. In formal botanical terms, these are called stipules, these two things here, which in many normal plants just dry up and fall off after the leaf is produced. They're part of protecting the first little bud of the leaf. But here they've been evolved to where they're swollen and big, big volume inside. The ants can clean them out, so there's a house. So now we have a house. We have nectaries that make sugar. What next? These are the leaf tips of the ant acacia. Now, all other acacias don't have these little orange bodies on the tips of the leaflets. Everyone? Those little tips are modified leaf tips full of protein, fats, and vitamins. And more than that, the proteins are animal proteins made by a plant. So in effect, that little body right there is a mimic of an insect caught by the ant. So the ants go and chop those off and feed them to the larvae who are inside the thorns. So now we're feeding the ants solid food as well as the sugar from the nectaries. So here's, there's a nectary right there on that new leaf. It's just starting to expand. And the tips of each of the pieces of the new leaf are got a great big, they're called Belchin, B-E-L-T-I-A-N, Belchin bodies, named after the guy in the 1800s who described them, a guy named Thomas Belt. And um, so they're harvested by the ants, and then the, um, um, but they do not grow again. So it's a one-time thing. So there's a modified leaf tip, which is chopped off and taken back by the ants to the, uh, to the thorn. Now, so now we have solid food. We have nectaries, thorns, solid food, and now we have where they live. This is a map of Central America. This is, here's Texas up here, Mexico here, and Central America running down through here to the Panama Canal down here at the bottom. The black is where this thing lives. 
It's the lowlands in Central America, or Mexico down through Central America. Okay, that's, that's where it lives. Now this lowlands has certain ecological characteristics. This is what it looks like from up on a, on a, on a ridge, looking out on it. These are old pastures by agriculture. This is the forest itself uh, in the rainy season, in the time of year when the rains fall, which is six months. So basically we got January to May or December to May, we have a rain, we, sorry, from May to December, we have a rainy season. And then from, uh, from December to May, we have a dry season with almost no rain. So think like winter, except not cold, but rather no rain. Okay, so that's the terrain. Now, that's a, you see how green it is and all these tree canopies, and all that sort of stuff, it's all just looks like normal forest. But in the dry season, this is what it looks like. There are no leaves. In other words, the way these plants, the many, many species of plants who live here, make it through the dry season is to drop their leaves, just like your trees do in the wintertime, they drop their leaves. They don't try to keep them going during the cold winter. Except, you see there's a green spot right there. If we get up close to that green spot, here's an ant acacia, and here we are, all the other plants without any leaves, and the ant acacia with a full-blown canopy of green leaves, which pumps out sugar continually. So the ant colony living in that thing has got food all through the dry season. And the cost, the evolutionary event of the tree was, of course, to evolve the ability to keep itself leafy in the dry season. All the other acacias in this forest that don't have ants drop their leaves. So the ant acacia keeps its leaves. But these are the old leaves that you're seeing here that make nectar all the time, full golden leaves but it makes new leaves also, but without the chlorophyll. It makes tiny dwarfed leaves with Belgian bodies. So it's making the, the little false insects to feed the ants. So the ant colony doesn't just have to live on sugar for six months. It's got an equivalent of, of dead insects because these ants are the ones that were living in hollow twigs beginning, but evolutionarily, they have moved their food, their diet interests to being those Belgian bodies and the nectaries, and they don't go out and be predators anymore. So their goal is keep the tree alive. That's their evolutionary goal. In other words, anything that trashes the tree lowers the fitness of the ant colony. So it's strongly selected to do things to keep the tree healthy. So here's the ants. If you want an actual name for uh, the acacia ants, it's Pseudomyrmex. This is the scientific name up here. And uh, there are about 15 species of them. These are the three species that I worked with the most. Um, so this is a Latin name, a scientific name. So here's the, as we say, the genus name. This is like Homo and Homo sapiens, or Drosophila and Drosophila melanogaster. Um, and uh, that's the genus name there. And then these are three species names. And the point being that there can be a number of these things living in the same place. So we can have one acre, one hectare of forest out there in the middle of this, and it can have three or four, one, two, three species of acacia ants all living in the same place, all occupying the same species of acacias. So of course, what I've already described here is territorial ownership, because if you've got a nice acacia tree growing out in here and gets colonized, which we'll get to that in a minute, it gets colonized by one of those species of ants, and it most decidedly does not want to be colonized by another species of ant. So we get an ant war between the two, and one colony wins and one colony loses. And this can happen between species and among species. So if you're an established colony of species A and you get invaded by an established colony of species A from some other tree, you then get a war going also between the two members of the same species, except in one peculiar circumstance, which I'm going to describe a little bit later on, okay? 
So there's our tree green, and it'll stay green like that all through the dry season. But it pays a cost to do that. Its cost is in its genome that it has to now make leaves, has to make nectaries, has to make food bodies. And of course, those old leaves that you see up there, all photosynthesizing, making food for the plant as well. Okay. So here's our genus name, Pseudomyrmex. And um, these are three species of that. Uh, I've had this slide up here forever because those are my sort of pins into my own ecological research because these different three different species have slightly different behaviors to each one. Uh, Belti likes uh, very intense sunny spots. Pterogenea does pretty good, well in, in intermediate and Nigrosinca likes very um, shady spots. Um, but um, that, that's sort of irrelevant at this point. But that's why there's three names up there. So now let's ask the question, what does the ant colony itself consist of? So here's an, a nice two meter tall, two and a half meter tall ant acacia, probably about three, four, three, four, five years old, something like that, growing in an old pasture. This is, this is obviously where the forest was cut down some earlier time to make food for cattle. And um, here's the ant acacia growing, through, growing up there, fine. So now how do you know what kind of an ant colony is in this? How big is it? What's it consist of? Well, it's a very brutal thing. You simply walk up to the tree with a machete in your hand and you cut it down. With one swipe, down it goes. Now the ants get very upset, of course, because you've just attacked their home. And um, so they react just like they would react if this was a big browsing mammal. Um, if we were talking about some prehistoric mammal that came along and tried to eat it, or if, uh, if a cow or a horse tried to eat it, of course they wouldn't because they very quickly learned not to. But the point is um, that this is the reaction by the colony as being threatened, which of course it is. So now, how do you, how do you catch all the ants on that plant? Well, entomologists, insect people like myself, who spent their lives collecting insects, have this thing called an aspirator. Basically what it boils down to is a, um, a long operated vacuum cleaner. This copper tube that you see right here has got a screen on the, a copper screen across the base of it, right inside that cork. So that when air goes in this, anything that's in the air, oh, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. This copper screen is on the, it was right here on this thing. So anything that comes into the air here goes into this container. But there's a screen right here that keeps these ants from going up this tube because you're on the other end of it, sucking the air in. Okay, so you're that vacuum cleaner. You're providing the force. So basically what you do is you stand there at this tree and you can see there's probably about 3,000 ants in that bottle right there right now. And you're basically going up and down the stems, sucking the ants off the surface to get them into the bottle. When you've got a big batch like this in the bottle, you then put this tube here into a small chamber that's got cyanide in it. And you take a small inhale of the cyanide. That goes into here, kills all the ants. You can then pour them out into a container, close up the cork at the top, close the cork back up, and start over again. It took about six hours for me to collect all the ants from that acacia, just continually doing this. And in order to do it, I had to have a piece of hard rock candy underneath my tongue all the time because that stimulates my mouth to produce saliva. The ants are very upset. So they produce what are called alarm pheromones. They've got glands that generate chemicals that go out into the air and every other ant reacts to them by frantically running around to look for who is the disturbance, who is bothering us. And so, which they would then attack. But, so these ants in here are generating an enormous amount of that pheromone. So when you're sucking that pheromone in, it gives you a horrible sore throat unless you have saliva constantly dripping through your mouth, 
cleaning it out of your mouth. Okay. So that's the way we catch all the ants who are brave enough to come out of the thorns and angry enough to come out of the thorns and run around on the surface. But once you get all of those collected, you go through by hand and pull all the thorns off. So this is a big pan full of the thorns off that tree. And these all have ants in it were the ones that were destined by their age to stay in the thorns to protect the brood, the larvae, the immatures that are still inside the thorns. Incidentally, for those of you of a more recent scale edge, you all use digital cameras. That's a Kodak roll of Kodak 25 film, uh, which is what we all used to survive on in the old days before we had digital cameras. And so we used all that kind of thing for scale. That's about an inch and a half tall, something like that. Um, so then you take this and you put it in a freezer. Take it out of the freezer and break open each thorn. So now we dump out the contents of these thorns. So now we can see what was in each one of those thorns. Now the, the, the worker ants, which you'll see in a minute more, is, is there's one right there. They're kind of small. There's another small one right here. These with wings on them, you see the wing off the back of the, and they're brown, those are queens, virgin queens, who have not yet gone out to be mated. There are very few in this particular case of dark ones. There's a black one right there, that's a male. And he also is a virgin male who has not gone out to be mated. And then these white things right here, some of them are larvae. There's a, a larva right there with the stomach contents, the dark stomach contents visible through the gut wall. Here's another one here. And then there, these are the pupae for more virgin queens. So this thorn had mostly young larvae which were growing up to become virgin queens is what they were. Some other thorns will have more for larvae. Uh, here's a larval pupa right there, that yellow thing that you see there. So each thorn has got all these contents. So you take that content, and here's what it looks like close up. So here are the larvae, here are the virgin queens. There's a pupa right there of a worker. Here is a pupa of a queen, here, right here. And there's another pupa of another queen, another one there. And um, I should mention to you here, in case I forget it later on, uh, that each one of these queens is diploid. The queen, when she laid the eggs, made a decision as to whether she wanted to produce more queens, more workers, or males. This is a male right here, this dark one. And he comes from a not fertilized egg. So she controls the number of workers, the number of female larvae in the colony, by making a decision as to how many eggs to fertilize. And every one she doesn't fertilize produces a male, a haploid male. These are diploid females. So, that, um, uh, so that's one piece of what you're seeing in this photograph. Another piece of what you're seeing is this larva right here is lying on its side. And you see how the head end is bent forward that way. There's a pouch, right? there, right under its chin. And into that pouch is where the worker ant puts the Belgian body. So it collects the Belgian bodies from out there, chops them into several pieces, brings them back, and sticks one into that pouch. If you starve this colony so there's no more Belgian bodies, no more nectar, the worker ants take larvae, like this one here, chop them up in pieces and feed the other larvae so that the colony stays alive but shrinks, gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So until, that's what happens if it doesn't have any leaves on its acacia, so there's no more food coming in. The colony may stay alive through the rest of the dry season by cannibalizing its own individuals. Okay. Now, the tree had a lot of these small thorns, just a straight V with a small volume. There's not much volume in that really. Here, the black spot right here is the entrance hole of that thorn. Um, inside of those, 
basically are worker ants raising more worker ants. But somewhere on the tree, there's huge thorns. You see these two great big ones right here? And there's another big one there, another big one there. The queen ant will be in one of those big thorns. And there will be one queen. So she started the colony. She started it by killing anybody else who tried, but she may not success. Maybe she got killed and another one takes over and becomes the queen for the colony. And from then on, her offspring owns the tree. That's, that's her. The tree is really a genetic expression of herself. Excuse me, the ant, the ant colony is a genetic expression of herself. So now let's take these big ones and open them up. And finally, we find the one, see how big it is here, that has the queen in it. And there she is right there. And notice that inside that thorn was an enormous number of soldiers, these workers right here. They are the oldest ants in the colony, i.e. the most experienced ants, the ones that are somehow enlisted to be the queen's retinue, the ones who are best at protecting her from everything else. Because for example, what is the everything else? Starving monkeys in the dry season, go to a tree like this, grab a thorn off of it, rip it open and eat the ant larvae and the ants inside. <coughs> Birds do the same thing. They go to the hole in the end of the thorn, ram their bill in it and split the thorn to eat the larvae inside. Well, she's in a thorn, first off, that's extremely tough. Second, the fibers through the thorn itself are not straight. They're straight on the other ones, but in these they wrap around so that it's hard to split this thorn, very hard to split this thorn. And she's inside of it protected. And you can see our abdomen is very large. There's her abdomen. It's very large and swollen because her ovaries are very large. So she, she's pumping out a couple of eggs a day. Here's an egg here, another egg, another egg, and an egg, and an egg. And like I say, she decides which of those is going to be a male, which is going to be a female. And as she does this, the tree is growing. Oh, the worker ants are taking these eggs to the other thorns where they raise them. Okay. Or they, you know, maybe they'll raise them to be a, a, a queen or, or a male as well. But the point is she's very swollen and notice her size of her abdomen compared to this abdomen over here. This is a virgin queen here. She has all six legs. All insects have six legs. And she has two there and two there, and there's two on the other side. She has six legs. If we count these legs, we get one, two. She only has two legs. What happened to the other four? The tree is growing all the time. So the new branches are always higher up on the tree. The old branches down low get shed by the growing tree. If she's in one of the lower branches in one of those big thorns, when that branch dies and is gonna be shed, she's gotta get out of that big thorn, go up the tree, go into another big thorn, and continue her reproductive activity. How does she do that? Because the entrance hole and the thorn is just big enough for her head and thorax to get through, just barely. She stops reproducing. Her abdomen shrinks back down to almost this size. And once it's shrunk down to almost this size, she tries to get out of the thorn through the hole. But these are not green thorns anymore. These are old, dry, hard thorns. And she gets stuck. And her legs are sticking out. Her abdomen is stuck inside. The worker ants come and grab the legs and try to drag her through the hole. And as they do this, they bite off, pull off pieces of her legs. So that she gradually loses a leg here, a piece of a leg there, a leg here, a leg there. And the more legs she loses, the more likely that once she gets out of the thorn, she 
cannot walk up the tree to get to the next big thorn to go inside. And of course, they're trying to help her all the time. But if she falls off the tree, she's dead. She can be dead because a lizard or some other predator gets her on the ground, uh, or she just hasn't got enough legs anymore to be, to be able to be carried or dragged anywhere. And so that's part of limiting her lifespan. And so they don't live forever. They, can, they may live uh, 10 years, they might live 20 years, but, but um, there's this mortality factor that's taking place that's cutting their age back. All this is relevant to the whole biology of the system. So now here's our whole colony laid out in bowls. These bowls are about six inches across like that. In that whole colony, there was this number of worker ants, this number of worker ants, this number of virgin queens, this number of males. Notice that there are fewer males than females. And all of the brood over here, the larvae, the pupae, how do we separate these things? You dump the whole thing in water, and the adult ants, all of these, float, and all the larvae sink. So that separates the two. Then by using a screen of different sizes, we managed to get the, the workers out into two sets. And then the, these things here are, are bigger yet, and the, the males are small, but these were picked out by hand. Now, in this particular case, there were two queens, one there and one there. That's very exceptional. I've dissected hundreds of ant colonies, and this is the only one, and it happened to happen right in the middle of a biology course, where we got two reproductive queens out of the same tree. And um, that was a very startling event. We don't really understand. It's possible that they were sisters originally, but I have to speculate. I, I don't know. So that's our ant colony. Now at this point, how do we get started with an ant colony? I think what we ought to do is take a five minute break. And right now my clock says, just a second. says 152. Let's readjourn at two o'clock, eight minutes from now. Let's readjourn at two o'clock and we'll go for 20 minutes longer and then we'll close down. Okay. So that's, that's, that's meant to be a break. Um, obviously, I've talked a really long time here and uh, my voice holds up, but I'm sick to you. would like to get up and walk around and do whatever. So um, we'll just stop right there at this point. So exactly at two, two o'clock, we'll start up again. Four. Huh? Four. Two. Yeah, four o'clock, right. Four o'clock. I mean, oh, sorry, two o'clock my time. Yes, I'm talking to you from 3,000 miles away. That's just fine. No, I'm okay here. Thank you. I've got lots of tea here.
Yes, I was just looking to see. I think that when I come back on, I'm going to take a minute to describe more what's in our house. Maybe not. Yes. Not yes. with a pandemic. Oh, no. <laughs> you could do the front yard. Huh? Front yard. Yeah. Front yard. The bags and everything. Yeah, we can't see anything though. Oh, there's just one bag you can see. So. That's right. Dan, there is a good question. There, there's, a, there's a really good question from one, one student. There's a real good question from one student. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, what happens to the, the Virgin Queens? What happens to the Virgin Queens? We're going to deal with this in about the next five slides. And, and can I do like, uh, can I get like one, two minutes before you start to make some, some announcements to yeah. students? Can Ozan have a couple of minutes for him to make announcements before sure. you start speaking? Sure. Yeah, but let's wait until, until uh, four o'clock. Yes. Mm -hmm. Brad wants you to show them a boa live, of course. Brad wants you to show them a boa live. <laughs> Okay, we're up to two o'clock now. Mm -hmm. oh, Ozan, is this a time that you would like time to talk to them? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, so welcome to the class. I know you have a lot of questions about like a lot of things, uh, about like how the grading will be, how the exams will be. Before asking your questions, Make sure that you go and read all the guidelines we have written for you on Canvas. Like everything you are you need for this class will be on Canvas, basically. Like we 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 we, we type everything you will need. And if you still have questions about how things will work, you can ask your questions using Piazza to us. We will be answering those. Okay. Is that it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll get back to work here. Before uh, we go back to the slides themselves, let me just mention that I can see that uh, right over my shoulder, there's an open door. Um, we, uh, we are sequestered, self-sequestered, if you like, um, in the middle of a national park in Costa Rica. I uh, have been here since uh, uh, Christmas last year. 
Um, this is where we live normally as squatters uh, in a Costa Rican national park. And um, we're here about six months of every year. And normally we're back there in Philadelphia for the uh, fall semester teaching this course. Um, the second thing to mention is that um, the house is wide open. There's a lot of animals who circulate in and out uh, and out in front of the house, I, but it's not easy for me to, to show them to you. Uh, the third thing is that um, as I look down your names in the, in the class roster, I can see there might be some people who actually live in the vicinity of um, either this particular lecture, the Anacasias, uh, or um, for other lectures. And if you tell me, if you send me a specific question by email to, to, to tell me this, I could probably tell you where you could go to find this actual interaction going on well, when you go home for Christmas or for for vacation or whatever it happens to be, when you'll be back in the place where you normally live, I might well be able to tell you where to, to find these things. And I can say that uh, because I've spent my whole life traveling around the globe to the places where these kind of interactions take place. Um, the reason why I had that map of, of Central America with the black uh, distributions for the annexation in it is because in the 1960s, I drove basically every road from Texas to the Panama Canal, mapping where the Anacasias uh, took place. Okay, so now we'll go on to the next um, to the next slide, and the question that was put to us uh, in, in Piazza was, uh, "What happens to the Virgin Queens?" Well, that's exactly where we're headed now, um, and um, here we are with me climbing to the top of a tree about. 10 meters off the ground at uh, four o'clock in the morning, while it's still black dark. Um, and uh, on that tree, oops, I've got to get my pointer back here. On that tree is this queen virgin ant right here. Now this happens to be Pseudomermix belti, it's black. The ones you were looking at earlier are Pseudomermix ferruginea, which are the rust-colored ones. Okay, so this is the this is Belti, and she is standing still on the tree bark, having flown from her acacia to this tall tree top, to the tallest object in the countryside, to stand there in the black dark, raise her abdomen up, and open up the genital chamber back here. So you see the sting sticking straight up? That's her sting that she would use to protect herself. Except now she's extended it out and up. So there's a cavity right here. And out of that cavity is where she's liberating her sex pheromone. This is not an alarm pheromone. This is her male attractant pheromone, which is carried downwind from this point in the black dark. And here is a male just arriving having flown upwind to find her in the black dark. So he's just about to land. While he's just about to land, right here on the front end is another ant of another genus, which is a predator ant. And he's grabbed her by the antenna. Well, she's, you see, normally she would run away from him, but she can't because she's motionless up here calling males. So he has grabbed, excuse me, this one, they're all she, all these worker ants are she's. She has grabbed this queen's antenna and is trying to drag it off as a prey item. So this has got to happen very fast, all right? So what's happened is she does this, he comes sailing in, lands, and climbs on. So here he is, right here, the worker ant, is left behind. Here's the, the other ant. See the other ant that was grabbing her antenna? She's turned around now. So she was swiveled this way. She turned around and he's now attached to her for 10 seconds. And in those 10 seconds, he passes to her all the sperm she's going to use for 20 years if she lives that long. And that's the sperm that she doles out one at a time for each one of the eggs to fertilize to a female. And the unfertilized eggs make males. Okay, so now that takes 10 seconds to do this. After 10 seconds, which I timed in those days being 
uh, trying to be very scientific. I timed this with um, stopwatch. After 10 seconds, the two of them jump off and land in the air. And in the air, he uncouples from her. She goes to the ground. He goes off searching for another female. His chances of finding another female are very low. But that's what he's, that's what he's going to do. She lands on the ground and goes looking for a young acacia tree. So here's the name of the tree that we're actually going to look for. And where did that young tree come from? Here's the flower, or you would call it a flower, but it really it's an inflorescence because each of these little things there, and there's about, um, about a thousand individual flowers on that inflorescence, each one very small. And this bee up here is collecting pollen from the pollen that's on the surface and collecting it on his hind legs right here. So he's gonna, no, she is gonna take that home to a nest, but in the process, she'll visit other flowers and pollinate some of, of the little tiny, as we say, florets on this, on this inflorescence. So from that pollinated flower comes one fruit. So here's the fruit, think a bean pod. Think like a pea pod or a bean pod split open. And here's the pulp on the inside. And inside of that is a seed. There's about 10 seeds in that active pulp, which is out on these long fibers. So it's swinging in the wind. So a bat or a bird can pick it off without having to land on the antacacia. This is an, a new adaptation that the antacacia evolved to have its ant protections, which would otherwise keep the seed dispersal agents from getting through the fruit. And if I go back to here, I will point out that the worker ants do not patrol the flowers. So the worker ants have evolved the behavior of not patrolling flowers, which of course, if they patrol the flowers, that would stop the reproduction of the tree. Okay. So, no, incidentally, here's a hole in the thorn right here. Okay. So then over here, we have the fruit. The tree is, it's done its part here in effect by putting these out open free, swinging in the wind so a bird or a bat can pick them off to eat them without, uh, without having to land on the tree and deal with the ants at all. So then the seed lands in a new open area, germinates and produces a seedling. But here's a seedling with the nice big leaves, but you notice there's no thorns. So the seedling starts out being a very normal looking acacia with no thorns. Why? Because making thorns and Belgian bodies is expensive. So it puts its first investment from the seed, which is what is, you know, the seed is its lunch packet, right? It puts that into making solar panels. So that's what these are. So it makes solar panels to accumulate enough energy to start making the first panel, first thorns and to start making the first Belgian bodies. And then it becomes a bonsai because here's our little tree growing as one year old, two year old, three year old, four year old, at least four. And it grows, yes, but it doesn't have an ant colony. And its leaves are very, very edible to herbivores, which we'll see more of later on. But finally, it gets enough resources to make a thorn, another thorn, another thorn, another thorn. There's no colony in this tree. It's terrible shape. It's lost parts, parts of its leaves. It's had stems eaten off over and over again. It has not been able to make a serious set of thorns. Why? Because a queen ant didn't find it. So here she is now, after walking as much as 30 days with no food, looking for one of those little bonsai antacacias. And when she finds one, if the thorn is still green, she can cut a hole right there in the thorn, go inside, hollow out the thorn, lay her first eggs, and block the hole in the thorn with her head to keep anybody else from getting in, a competitor or a predator. But she has to eat. So how is she going to eat? She has to go out and visit the nectaries. And if there's any new Belgian bodies form, she has to get them too. 
So when she's gone, some other queen, virgin queen, comes along and finds the same thing with the hole already cut, zips inside, throws out her kids, blocks the hole with its head, and continues trying to raise a colony. If there's a lot of queens in the process, you never get a colony. So if there were a lot of anacacias in the area, they produced lots of queens. And the lots of queens all block each other. So nobody, you don't get any. So this is the population regulation system that operates in this system. This is why you don't end up with a whole forest of anacacias. Because as the colony density goes up, the number of queens goes up. The number of queens goes up, the survivorship of young colonies goes down. So that's what's going on with that founding queen, when she's that virgin queen, and we call her a founding queen at this point because she's founding a colony, and she does not accept the brood from the previous. So every time the new one gets in there, it has to start over again, and it takes about a month to get worker ants. The worker ants start patrolling the tree, and then, boom, it goes from bonsai to healthy, fast-growing, lots of thorns, lots of leaves, belching bodies, nectaries, and that, that's a meter stick next to this young tree. And that's about a one, nine months of growth. Whereas the little bonsai tree we were looking at before, as I say, that's three or four years old. And look how this is 20 centimeters tall. Once this thing gets a colony, it can protect itself. It does this, boom, and you get a nice big tree. And that's after like less than a year of growth. After two years of growth, it looks like that. So you can see what a difference it makes to have a real ant colony. Because now you've got a permanent army protecting you from other queens, yes, and all the insects and mammals who would eat your leaves as well. Now, we only have five more minutes. And so I want to stop here rather than go on to what's the obvious next step. Now, up until this time, it's been what you and I would call, or what the world has called, natural history. In other words, much of what I've been telling you, not all, but much of what I've been telling you, I discovered by bumbling around in this landscape, just poking and thinking, taking pictures. But in 1880, a mining engineer in Nicaragua who had to go from mine to mine to mine to inspect the mines, rode a mule. And mules are not fast. And as he rode a mule from mine to mine to mine, he watched these anticacias going by him. It's like you on the interstate watching working people's houses as you go, go down the interstate. And described this basic system in a book in the 1800s that he took back to Europe. And that is a whole nother story. We're going to get to that in a minute. But the point is, so far we're dealing with natural history, just what anybody could find out by just walking around and asking questions. And the asking questions, I'm going to use four more minutes for the last thing. The person with the ruler in his hand is Cayo. He was a Mexican colonist. This was his father's cornfield that we're looking at here. And um, when I was uh, standing out here marking these trees, not knowing anything about who owned them or who owned the land or nothing, uh, as a graduate student from Berkeley, um, he came by with a herd of goats, and uh, like 50 goats, right? And he walks up to me, and he has around his neck a necklace made out of my tags that I had been put on the trees to know which tree was which tree. I looked at him and I realized that, uh-oh, you know, yeah, sure, he stole my tags, but he didn't know any better. They were just interesting things hanging in the trees. So <coughs> he walks up to me and he says, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm looking at these annotations and I gave him about a one sentence answer. <coughs> I didn't understand what I was dealing with. <coughs> and he said to me, oh, okay. So he goes off with his goats. About three hours later, he comes back with the goats holding in his hand a branch of the antacacia. And he walks up to me and he asks me all kinds of detailed questions, just like one of you would. Now this is a farm kid who never made it through second grade. 
He's 16 years old. He will spend his life that way. And as they say, he looks at me and he asks me all the detailed questions. What are the nectaries? What are the Belgian bodies? Why are there so many little leaves here? What are the ants doing? What is the hole in the thorn? I mean, the whole package. And I looked at him, I said, whoa. I said, where, where do you live? And he pointed to a shack up on the top of a hill. Turned out I was in his father's cornfield, right? Or the remains of his father's cornfield. And um, so we went to meet his father. And in those days at Berkeley, if you were a graduate student, you never had an assistant. That was absolutely verboten. But I didn't really grasp that, and I've never been really up to the full bureaucracy of anything. And so I sat down with the father, and we started talking, and I was trying to negotiate for how much would I have to pay Cayo to work for me as an assistant. And my father thought I was trying to negotiate with him, so how much he was going to have to pay me to take Cayo as his apprentice, as my apprentice. Because in Mexico in those days, the way you grew up your young man was to apprentice him to somebody. And the somebody always charged you for apprenticeships, like the owner of a garage, a gas station, okay, or a grocery store. So we ended up with a giant sum of $7 a week. And Kyle enabled an enormous amount of my research that we're going to be talking about now on the next, the next on, on, on Thursday. Um, by, and became a really first class member of this thing. He would have been an absolutely superb graduate student in some later time. Um, so we'll stop and he, oh yeah, that Cayo has now become what we call a para-taxonomist. And the category of Cayo has become what we call a para-taxonomist. It's what you know as a paralegal, a paralegal or a paramedic, okay? Somebody who knows a great deal about doing things but has not got the university formal approval degree kind of things to go with that knowledge. Okay. And he saves your life when he gets to the car accident on the highway, when he's the ambulance driver. Okay. So we'll stop here with Kayo and uh, start over again or start further on Thursday. So see you all then. And you can stick your questions into, into Piazza if you wish, but um, please do as Ozan said, Read all the stuff on the uh, Canvas site first because many of your questions will be answered about the logistics of the course. Okay. All right. Thank you. See you next Thursday. Okay.